if you can find the right criticism and make yourself truly open to it, you can get smart really, really fast. But most of the time, the critic has an agenda that goes beyond making you better at your craft. And understanding the critic's agenda is essential because they don't see what you see. They don't want what you want. They don't believe what you believe. And if you can get past those three things, maybe there's something to be learned there. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Today on the show, someone who's been massively influential in our businesses, Ian. My name is Seth Godin. Seth Godin is something of a legend and hardly needs an introduction, but let's take a stab at it. His books about marketing, creativity, building companies, personal development include some of my favorites like Purple Cow, Meatball Sunday, The Dip. Ian, what's your favorite Seth Godin book? The dip is good. Personally, I think Lynchpin is my favorite. Why do you like it? You know, when I read it, I think at the time, we had several people in our organization, the company that we uh, sold in 2015. And I was kind of thinking about it in terms of those people and how they viewed their careers. I was thinking about it in terms of how I viewed my career. And like the bottom line for that book was like how to become an indispensable part of an organization, team, environment. It wasn't just like how to make the most money or like how to become like the MVP, but it's just how to be an important piece of the puzzle, not just in business, though, in life. In life. Yeah. Lynchpin is that book that I suggest people read when they're struggling in their career. In addition to his book, Seth has also founded an intensive four week alternative online MBA called The Alt MBA. And he also has created some really great podcasts. One of the best known is probably Startup School, which I know, Ian, is is one of your favorites. He's recently launched a new podcast called Akimbo. Ian, me and you are both early adopters as well. Yeah. (laughs) What sticks out to you about Akimbo? You know, we were kind of discussing earlier, it's like, what is it about this show that we really like? Number one, I just like hearing Seth's voice and his stories. Anytime I hear the guy's voice, it's just like, this is going to be fun. (laughs) I can't wait to listen. But Seth is a marketer. A lot of stories he tells, though, I feel like they really just apply to the real world and the broader world, not just marketing, not just online business. And he's really great at telling stories that hook me in. Yeah, I think it's such a rare skill to be able to address a broad audience with actionable messages without watering them down. And and somehow Seth has managed to do that his entire career. So we kicked off the interview, which is pretty wide ranging, as you'll hear, by asking Seth, who puts a lot of time into thinking through projects before embarking on them, what motivated him to start Akimbo? I don't spend a lot of time dithering. I spend almost no time dithering. What happens is I've pushed myself to be open to notions and hints and possibility. That when I see something in the world that I think I could make better, I give myself permission to talk to myself about how I could make it better. So there's a lot of inbound in my life, 10, 15 times a day. I'm saying, well, why don't I make a better interface for Skype? Or why don't I figure out some way to make voter participation go up or whatever? So there's this constant inbound. And then the question is, do you become a wandering generality by playing with everything a little bit in public? And what I discovered and what I wrote about in the dip is that's not a really good strategy and that it's better to commit to the things you're going to commit to and take them to their logical conclusion rather than doing a lot of things half-assed. So with the podcast, you know, I did my first podcast, which is still out there probably seven years ago. I did them all in a weekend. Startup school. Yeah, it's it's called the startup school. And I've been thinking about, because I listen to a lot of podcasts, how could it be interesting? How could it be different? How could it be better? Was there something about 
what existed in the podcast space that you felt you could do better? Well, better is the wrong word. I love a whole bunch of podcasts. I love Hardcore History with 14 hours on Genghis Khan. And I love Radio Lab with 30 minutes on the Dancing Tube Man. So they're all over the map. Mystery Show Episode 3 remains the gold standard, the single best episode of any podcast ever recorded. Whoa. I know I could never make anything better than Mystery Show Episode 3. But there was, I think, a lot of room for different. Different is an interesting area for me. I played in the area of different for a long time. So one of the things I knew was no guests because I love being a guest. I enjoy interview shows, but I didn't want to make another interview show. And so the question I had was, well, what if I was the guest? What if I was the guest on my own show every time? How would that structure and where would it go? And then I thought about the fact that audio tape is free. So there's a temptation to make things really long. So what if I could discipline myself to make it as short as possible? And then the third element was, what if I added something I've never heard before, which is Q&A with the audience? We're used to that on the radio, but podcasts can't be live. So how does that work? And so I've tried to incorporate those three elements into a new kind of podcast. Speaking about Startup School, Seth, I think that that's probably the podcast that I recommend to the most people, believe it or not. Hey, it's Seth Godin. In the summer of 2012, I had an amazing opportunity to spend three days with a group of extremely motivated entrepreneurs, people right at the beginning of building their project, launching their organization. During those three days, I took them on a guided tour of some of the questions they were going to have to wrestle with, some of the difficult things. That's the business podcast that I pass around to the most people. And there's been such a long lag between that podcast and your current podcast. Did you think about starting this podcast sooner? Oh, yeah. Every week. Every time I turned on a podcast and listened to it, I was talking myself out of making a podcast. My challenge with podcasts is that when you're in someone's earbuds, it's pretty intimate. So I was loath to make that sort of commitment, but I felt like this was a moment in time when a whole bunch of people are starting to listen to podcasts and I would show up and see how that felt. You know, I believe audio and interaction are the two powerful contributions of this decade. That audio, an audio book, something you can listen to again and again, really gets under the skin. And most of the authors I know actually get a bigger check from Audible than they get from their book publisher now. Because it turns out that audiobooks for nonfiction are really special, and so are podcasts. And then the second thing is interaction. And so most of my time is now spent on the Alt MBA and the marketing seminar. And both of those are built around interaction, not consumption. Because we're discovering that the way all of us were taught in school doesn't make a lot of sense, that more tests and more studying don't lead to smarter people. Seth, this is going to be one of the few episodes that my friends who aren't entrepreneurs are going to sort of peruse on by the show, and they'll probably give it a listen. It's been interesting to watch you as one of our own, an entrepreneur, go out into the broader world and offer something in a way that I don't think many do. I'm curious, what do you think the business world has to offer to like the broader world? Business is continually in transformation. Business used to be, how do you build a factory to create a scarce object that you can sell for money. But business is also Howard Schultz deciding 20 years ago to give every one of his employees health insurance. And business is also the idea that we can find people who don't look like us and elevate them and give them positions of authority and influence and change the culture as we do it. And business is deciding, like they did at Patagonia, to actually make the world cleaner than you found it. And when you add up all those things, business can do a lot of stuff. It's not perfect and it has a lot of defects. But just as we learned from Leonard Bernstein or from Dostoevsky, I think that we can learn from how an enlightened business person does their craft. I heard recently that you were invited to speak with classical musicians. Like, What kind of message would you want to impress on a group like that? I've spoken at Carnegie Hall a couple of times and the Juilliard School and the Manhattan School of Music. 
because I feel very strongly that many of these students have been deceived, that since they were four years old, they have been told that if they practice enough, they will get rewarded with a stable slot in an orchestra and spend 20 or 25 years of your life to become at the top of your craft, to learn to play the music as written, and then you get a prize. Well, the metaphor there is not lost on me. Play it as written is the same as will this be on the test. And that's the same lie that most of us were taught. What we need are people who don't play it as written. We need people who play it the way they feel it. We need people who are gonna play it better or differently or in a new way. That is where all the rewards go. So my pitch to this group of talented, committed people, way more committed than you or I will ever be, is aim that talent and aim that commitment somewhere else. Instead of trying to become more obedient and fitting in more than everyone else, instead of trying to win the double blind audition by playing the notes more perfectly, figure out how to organize and connect and lead, figure out how to make music we would miss if you were gone. Because the truth is, there is no classical music shortage. The truth is, if a cello player uh, in the second chair of the St. Louis Symphony got sick, we could put a different cello player in her slot and no one would notice. And this group deserves better than that. And so I rant for about an hour and a half, and then I run away before they throw anything at me. Where are they going to get hung up with this message? Well, it seems obvious to you, and it might seem obvious to me. It's the opposite of obvious to them. Everyone they are surrounded with, everyone who supported them on this journey, it's attractive precisely because it's about compliance and conformity. That is its attraction, that a parent puts a kid into this program to teach them to study and to do what's on the test and to teach them to comply and to fit in. That's what they're doing. And if you think about the difference between Philip Glass or any other composer who's modern, who changes things, and an oboe player who plays the music as written, they couldn't be further apart. The origin is we didn't used to have record players. So we needed people who would be perfect reproductions of what a machine does now. And if that sounds like the typical person in the typical job, it's not an accident because that's also what we teach at so many college level courses. We don't teach people to do their own work, to be innovative, and to challenge the status quo. We teach them to get an A on the test. One of your most recent podcasts was called I See You, and you talked a lot about this. Josiah Wedgwood figured out how to do it to pottery. Josiah's father was an itinerant potter, like all potters in England at the time, digging up clay in the woods and hand-fashioning it into a pot that was almost good enough. What Josiah did was figure out how to do that at scale, in a factory, without skilled labor. One person doing one job, somebody else doing another job, over and over again. Josiah Wedgwood was so successful at this that when he died, he was one of the richest men in the world. And his heir, his grandson, a guy named Charles Darwin, used the money to finance his journeys around the world. You know, when I was listening to that episode, you were talking about this idea of people being individuals and people not fitting into the machine and being a cog. I think one of the interesting things that I've watched throughout your career is like you've kind of adapted like a, a social agenda when it comes to these types of things. I mean, I think it would have been very easy for you to just continue to make a bunch of money and apply your skills to be a professional marketer. Why have you adapted your skill set to focus on ideas like these? You are correct that every day it costs me money to not do selfish, banal, predictable work. And it's money I'm happy to pay. It has never occurred to me to not do this. I was raised by two extraordinary parents and won the birthday lottery. There's no doubt in my mind that people who have a voice should use it to make things better. And I don't understand the people who think that the purpose of culture is to create capitalism. I think the purpose of capitalism is to make the culture better. You put yourself out there in all these ways, and and we talk a lot about the lizard brain and getting criticized. Are there critiques that you receive that bother you, maybe because you feel they're legitimate in some ways? Criticism is an interesting 
project for someone who wants to do better work. Because if you can find the right criticism and make yourself truly open to it, you can get smart really, really fast. But most of the time, the critic has an agenda that goes beyond making you better at your craft. And understanding the critic's agenda is essential because they don't see what you see. They don't want what you want. They don't believe what you believe. And if you can get past those three things, maybe there's something to be learned there. But often we just use it as a crutch to hide. You know, I haven't read my Amazon reviews now in six years. And the day I stopped reading them was a good day. And I haven't missed it once. And for me, it's pretty clear. I'm never going to write that book again. If I'm never going to write that book again, knowing how to write it better won't do me any good. And yes, there's tons of feedback that I've treasured, but often we use it as a way to hide. Seth, I was reading your Amazon reviews today. (laughs) One of the things that jumped out to me is that your favorite book has not very many reviews at all. It sort of went quietly. It's true. I don't know if many people have read it. Why don't people read Survival is Not Enough? Just want to cut in here to say that Survival is Not Enough is a book about embracing change and the chaos that we all face as entrepreneurs and turning that into an asset in your business as opposed to building a business for which change can be a liability. Two things that happen there. The first one is tragic and sad, not for me, but for all of us. The book came out a few weeks after 9-11. And right after 9-11, it was hard to talk about the stuff I was talking about. People didn't feel a foundation there. But the other thing, because I spent a year giving speeches about that book, is that every time you talk about Charles Darwin and evolution on stage, 80% of the people in the audience, their eyes glaze over. And I'm not sure if it has to do with the Scopes Monkey Trial. I'm not sure if it has to do with some cultural avoidance we have of understanding the magnificent mechanism that makes evolution work, but people just don't want to hear about it. And I realized that I was barking up the wrong tree. And so I said, fine, that book was a joy to write eight hours a day for a year, but I'm going to move on. And today we're going to do a live ad read. This is an ad for a new product that we have launched called Dynamite Jobs. The idea is to connect entrepreneurs listening to this show with top professional talent that wants to work with them in their companies. But there's a catch. These are for remote distributed companies and they can be specifically challenging to hire for. And we specialize over at Dynamite Jobs in making that process easy. We're going to be the matchmaker in the middle, Ian. Play the right song at the middle school dance. Get everybody dancing in the center. You know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. (laughs) Here it is. It's real simple. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to get great people working for your company, just head on over to Dynamite Jobs. Fill out a brief survey and we'll get your polished job ad on the site in 48 hours. It's just that simple. And if you're looking for a job and a career that gives you more freedom and flexibility, allows you to work from home or from a remote location, Dynamite Jobs is for you too. Be sure to go over there and sign up for the mailing list. Bunch of jobs up there this week, Ian. Do check it out. Dynamitejobs.co. So Seth, I have this like personal project. I've been scouring the internet for books about people who've sold their business. Not just transacted a business, but like exited. It's underbooked. There's just not a lot of perspectives about this. And so this is actually my resistance. I've overcome and finished my first book on this topic. One of the best books I found was written by this guy that worked for Inc. Magazine for over 30 years named Bo Burlingham. Do you know him? Good guy. I had such an awesome conversation with him. And at one point in his book and in our talk, he mentioned that his research suggests that over 50% of entrepreneurs at some point are miserable after having exited. Have you found yourself on the dark side of that fence? I don't take lightly how lucky I was, how one in a million it is to be able to sell a company to Yahoo and to be present in Silicon Valley in 1999. It wasn't just my hard work. It was the hard work of 80 people who were 
like family to me, but it was one of the most miserable things I ever did. And I'm not sure that I could teach people very much because number one, there aren't that many people to teach. And number two, lots of people have different perspectives about how they approach business and what business is for. But it was really hard. And I think the reason it was hard is I mostly bootstrapped that company, meaning I ran it like a family and shifting gears in such a traumatic and dramatic way is hard. And I think a lot of times entrepreneurs think their job is to make money, but I think our job is to make a difference. What I'm hearing is you had 80 people that you were responsible for. And one day, maybe you had to walk into them and say, things are changing in a dramatic way. And I'm not going to be involved in this company anymore. Was it something along those lines that made this a difficult time? It was significantly more complicated than that. 98, 99 was an interesting, weird time in the internet business, because on one hand, the bubble was gaining speed. And on the other hand, it was bumpy. So we were out trying to raise another round because our competitors were intentionally losing millions of dollars because they had raised many millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So we were bidding on work where we were going to charge $250,000 for a project and our competition was going to charge a dollar. And so then someone offered to acquire us and we said yes, because it was the right thing to do. And then two weeks later, they backed out. So we were like swimming around in a big circle. So there was a lot of up and down all at the same time. And we opened as many doors as we could for as many of our people as we could. And some people did very, very well. And other people who didn't want to relocate or whatever, it was hard. But yes, a lot of it is, if you're not one of the top five people at a company, why did you take that job in the first place? And you probably didn't take it because you wanted everything to change. You probably didn't take it because you wanted it to be sold. And so the journey that people go on varies wildly depending on who's on that journey. And one of the challenges of building a company of scale is a lot of people are there for the mission and a lot of people just want a job. And getting those two things to dance with each other is always a challenge for every entrepreneur. What didn't you see about the emotional aspect at the time or you're just so busy that you didn't have the time to think about it? If I had to do it again, I'd do it again. I don't have any regrets. It's a little like a weightlifter doesn't have any regrets, even though his arms are really tired. Because you grow from it and you gain resources from it. But it was really hard. Since there aren't many guides like this, if there's any kind of framework for thinking about this sort of thing, I mean, it's not the only exit you've had. Entrepreneurs who are maybe thinking about selling, is there some advice you have for them? The advice I gave Derek Sivers when he was selling CD Baby, which he's written about, so I'm not violating a confidence, was if you care about the mission, you need to sell the company. Because he couldn't have taken it to the next level. It wasn't who he was. It wasn't who his team wanted him to be. So many entrepreneurs sell, need to sell, and should sell because the company isn't the company that they set out to run going forward. The two or three guys who started Starbucks aren't Howard Schultz. And if they hadn't sold it to Howard Schultz, there would never be a company we heard of called Starbucks. If you care about the mission, you might need to sell. But the other thing is, our society prizes money, but it doesn't understand money. And just because money's a number doesn't mean it's easy to measure. And just because you have money doesn't mean you can buy what you need with it. You know, if you need a jet ski, you can buy a jet ski. But if you need a sense of meaning or a place in the universe, you can't buy that. So an entrepreneur who's thinking about this transition should understand that One thing that they get is money, but one thing they give up is all that other stuff, and they better have a plan for earning it back. And the last thing I'd say is, and it's not going to take a week, it's going to take a year. It's interesting. I had this question, what's something about money that people without it don't understand? You sort of went some way to answering it there. Like Money's hard to get, but it's also something of a commodity. It's all around us, you know? And it doesn't purchase a lot of the things that we value the most. Yeah, I mean, we know that winning the lottery doesn't make people happy. We know that taking your company public doesn't make people happy. That if you want to be happy and you win the lottery, you will. If you want to be happy and you sell your company or go public, you might. Do you think it's possible to believe 
that though, if you don't have money, I don't know if I would have ever been a big enough person to buy that. Not that it, of course it doesn't buy happiness, but that's not going to stop me from wanting it. Does that make sense? I hear you. We need to be really careful about what we mean when we say don't have money, right? So if you go to Kabira or you go to Borelli, India, or you go to someplace, a reservation for Native Americans where people are making three or four or five dollars a day, those people don't have money. But I don't want to say that someone who's listening to this podcast, somebody who has a computer in their pocket that a a few years ago would have cost a million dollars, doesn't have, quote, money. If you have a place to live and enough to eat for dinner tonight, at some level you have money. The question is, have you been brainwashed by our culture to believing you don't have enough? And what is enough? And the problem with the Kardashian mindset of, you know, infinite entertainment in exchange for infinite money is that doesn't make people happy. And enough isn't solved with cash. Enough is solved with something else. It's an interesting idea. You know, you mentioned the Kardashians. I don't think we've ever talked about them on this podcast, uh, thankfully, until this moment. So. <laughs> and I confess, I don't know the Kardashians or their work. I'm using them as an iconic, hyperbolic idea. How does somebody like you, uh, Dan and I talk about this regularly, how does somebody like you stay away from things like that? I'm constantly deleting apps off my phone. I'm constantly setting rules for myself on the internet because the internet's very different than it was in 2000. The internet was kind of like the Wild West. Dan and I figured out how to make money on it in around 2008. It was this cool cash machine. Then we started traveling. Then we started meeting people. Then we started talking about our message. And so I use it very differently, I think, than a lot of consumers do. But how do you personally stay away from that, I'll call it icky, side of the internet? Well, you know, in the Alt-MBA, we teach a lot about intentionality and design. And design thinking is about who's it for and what's it for. Everything we do, like this podcast, this podcast is not for cricket fans, nor is it for people who like horror movies. Who's it for is really clear. What's it for? What change are you seeking to make? So every morning, if I'm going to go to work and not go to a beach, I don't like the beach, but if I'm going to go to work, why? Who's it for? This work I'm doing, what's it for? What change am I trying to make? What's a good day? Is a good day that I just obeyed because then I should go work in a factory. So I have this craft I want to do. So when I'm presented with a TV show or an app or something that's supposed to be entertaining, I ask myself, is it going to help me? Is it going to help me get where I'm trying to go? Is it going to move my narrative about who I am and what I'm trying to do forward? And if I just want to chill, then I should go for a walk. I shouldn't chill by setting myself out to be the tool or the product for some social network that's going to make money off me. Seth, you went to uh, Stanford Business School to get another kind of MBA. It's true. What do you think of people who are making that decision nowadays? I've written about this a little bit, and I feel very strongly. If you want to go to work for one of a few industries that demand an MBA from a famous college and pay a lot, it's a no-brainer. Put up the $250,000 in cash and opportunity costs it's going to cost you. Go to Harvard, Stanford, or Kellogg, and then go make a million dollars a year. That's a fine, clear, well-lit path. But to go to a not famous business school, to go into debt, to learn stuff that you could learn in a quarter of the time for less than a quarter of the money, you're clearly not going for the education. You're either going for the piece of paper or for the network. And the piece of paper is worth less than ever before if it's not a famous business school. So I'm in favor of People constantly sharpening their saw, constantly getting smarter about this, usually by doing the work, not by sitting in a classroom. You know, I taught at NYU at their business school. I've been in classrooms more and more. We're watching spoiled, indebted kids checking their Facebook in lectures that cost hundreds of dollars an hour. And I don't see what they're doing it for because it's not the piece of paper because that's not a good shortcut. It's a bad financial decision at this point, right? For those kids, obviously, that are checking their Facebook, but just because the opportunity doesn't exist to make a million dollars for everybody when they get out of there, right? So I think what you're saying is 
if you actually have the ability, the skill set, the money, the mind, all that, it still makes sense to go to business school if you're on that trajectory. If you're not, like, for example, becoming a doctor, yes, of course, you still have to go to school. An engineer, yes, you need to go to school and get that degree. I guess the question is, there's very limited applications for these traditional education systems at this point. That kind of leads into the Alt-MBA. How do these people fit in to that system or do they? Are they just completely different people? We've had 1,800 students, so it's very hard to generalize. It's not a replacement for an MBA. It's not supposed to be. We don't teach hard skills. We don't teach the Black-Scholes option pricing model. We don't teach uh, Sturm Louisville multi-dimensional calculus. What we teach are how to see, how to make better decisions, how to persuade people of your point of view, how to give and get substantive feedback, how to ship, which you would hope everyone knew how to do. But it turns out that doing it at a higher level is a tremendously unfair advantage. Because once you're done, you're playing by a completely different set of rules and you have better lighting. So we've got people who are you know, senior brand folks and engineers at Amazon, but we also have people who an 86-year-old from the Isle of Man and everything in between. Because it's not about business, it's about being human. And if you have a job where you don't get to bring your human to work, probably not the job you deserve. Can you tell us a story about discovering Stephen Pressfield's work? <laughs> so no one was here because I used to work completely by myself. Now, because of the Alt-MBA, we have a team, but not a very big one. But it used to be just me coming in here. And I was working on Lynchpin. And it was a version of, you know, click, 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 except it was book, 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 book. And then Amazon put this book in front of me. And someone had mentioned it somewhere, but only once. And I bought it. And I started reading it and I yelled, literally yelled out in, in this very room where I'm sitting now, why wasn't I informed? <laughs> Which book was it? The War of Art. Okay. How is it possible that The War of Art was published and no one told me? <laughs> and it was a crisis because I wanted to steal everything in the book. <laughs> but I don't write like Steve and he had a different posture than me, so I I wasn't too tempted to steal everything, but, you know, I sent him a note and I said, it's okay with you. I start talking about resistance. He's like, bring it on. And then I spent a full year trying to get him to write a simpler, more accessible sequel to the book, which I ended up publishing called Do the Work. That book is now published by somebody else. But if you haven't read Do the Work and The War of Art, you really need to. Did you get to meet him or what was it like sort of? Oh, yeah, we're, fr we're, we're friends now. And one of my most treasured friendships is with Steve Pressfield. He is not anything like you think he is. Tell me about that. Well, he doesn't want more fans. He doesn't want to get on stage. He doesn't want to mentor or coach or be a consultant. He doesn't want people to know him for this work. He's a novelist. And the only reason he wrote the other book is so that people would stop bothering him. <laughs> no, what happens is, if you write screenplays in Los Angeles, people come to you for your advice. They want to know, how do you do this? And how do you do this? And I have writer's block. I have writer's block, whining, whining, whining. And Steve, rather than giving the same shtick to everybody, just wrote it down and said, here, read this. Stop bothering me because I have to go back to writing my novel. If people are struggling with their career, I give them linchpin. If they're struggling with their marketing, I give them purple cow. And if they're struggling to make the transition from sort of free agent to entrepreneur, we give them the original podcast series, which strangely enough is just listen right through it as if it were recorded last year. Did you have that in your mind, like that I'm going to make these principles timeless? No. In fact, if I thought people had been listening to it today, I would have spent way more time finding a better microphone. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was there's a former Ukrainian church across the street where sometimes I do events. And I decided to do a three-day or two-day about this topic. And I knew that I would hear from all these people who said it was too expensive. And I wasn't trying to be elitist, but I can't fit more than 80 people in the room. So I said, look, if you can't make it, we'll record it, and you can listen to it for free. And that's all. I was just trying to do a favor to the people who couldn't be in the room. You mentioned real quick that you have a small team around Alt-MBA. Part of what I would assume is difficult for you is 
being a creative, but then also running an organization. How do you kind of balance those two things? You know, when I was a book packager, the first bunch of years, I was a failure, but then I started to get traction. And I said to my three best clients, each of them, I said, if you would just agree to publish all my work, I'll do it for you for a quarter of the price. Don't wait for me to make something up and then bring it to you and then sell it to you and then charge you as much as I can. Let me just make stuff and you just publish stuff. And no one has ever wanted to take me up on that deal because it turns out that good ideas are scarce, but really scarce are people who will run projects. Really scarce is the impresario who says, I'll handle it. And there's a post on my blog that I posted on my birthday a few years ago called 30 Years of Projects. And it's 30 years of projects. And I left out a lot of them. But I realized that's really my contribution is that I'm shipping stuff on a regular basis. That if I hadn't written Lynchpin, then people could have just read The War of Art instead. And some of my ideas are replaceable. Some I was first, but they were going to get done anyway. The ability to show up and run the project, it's not how I want to spend my day because I like sitting and thinking and inventing, but I do spend my day doing that because I care about the work. And have you found it difficult to manage people? Can you tell us a little bit about like who is behind Seth? There's no one behind Seth. There are people standing next to me. The first rule that I try to follow is I don't hire someone unless you've worked for me first. So that usually means freelance projects kind of stuff. And I have an unusual, it turns out, management style, which is I don't manage people. They make promises and then they keep them. This self-leadership thing is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Most people would rather have a manager than have a mission and manage themselves. But I have no desire to say, where were you at three o'clock today? Did you take a long break? Like, (laughs) that's not on my agenda. Ian, at this point in the interview, what were your expectations of this conversation? Had they been met or how were you feeling? I've met a couple of, I'll call Seth famous, obviously. Yeah, he's famous. Let's just not beat around the bush. He's a famous guy. <laughs> I've met a couple of famous people that I've looked up to, you know, you're reading their books or watching their movies or whatnot, and you meet them in person and, and, you know, it can be a really great thing or it can be a really bad thing. For me, meeting Seth and having Seth on this podcast was a really great thing. What's always interesting is to see how the same or how different people are from how you perceive them. And I feel like Seth is a very cohesive person. And I don't know, that's something that I really value. He seems like the same guy that he is writing the books and on the podcast and in person. And so I thought it was very cool. Yeah. And we had like a technical malfunction at the beginning of the conversation too. And he he couldn't have been cooler about it. You know, a lot of people, when they attain that kind of status, they treat people differently. And he treated us like, better than a lot of just normal people would treat. You know what I mean? So you can understand there's a sensitivity or thoughtfulness to the way he approaches both his intellectual life and at least his social life as well. So that was pretty cool. So the final thing we got around to talking about was a business model called 1,000 True Fans. Now, this was originally coined by Kevin Kelly, the author, and is often reflected on by Seth and is relevant to his audience specifically because his audience, a lot of creative people, a lot of entrepreneurs who want to build their own products and art and market those products and art to the world. And so I thought he might have some unique insights into it. Now, for those who aren't familiar, the idea is basically if you can get a thousand true fans to pay you a hundred dollars every year to support your art or your business, well, then you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year and that's sustainable. So I was interested to ask Seth where he feels this business model couldn't go wrong in his view. In my experience, it always goes wrong exactly the same way. They say, now how do I get 10,000 fans? And they start asking people who aren't qualified to be a true fan what they like and what they don't like. So then they start dumbing it down and averaging it out and cheapening it up and losing the thread so they can get another zero. And the next circle may very well work. And you might end up with 10,000. But the circle after that, uh uh-uh. It's really, really rare that you get to the third circle. But the reason is because you've dumbed it down. You've taken away the joy and the magic. So at that point, the true fans have left. 
because you're not fan worthy anymore. Right. I got to imagine a lot of that comes from just feeling like in the society that we live in, like you don't have enough, right? So it's teaching people like, hey, you have enough. These thousand people, they are enough. There's also a lot of business education that says, okay, so you're making $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year. How do we scale this? Right. Is there any answer for people in the thousand true fans business model or is what they signed up for that what is beautiful and non-scalable? Well, the biggest answer is don't take investor money. Because investor money has to scale to infinity because they could give it to somebody else who is going to scale. I am really proud of the fact that between 98 and 99% of the people in the United States have never heard of me. (laughs) And I hope it stays that way. Like You guys have been very generous and kind in this interview and talking about the influence I've had over you. That means a lot. But when I meet someone who's never heard of me, that's good too. Because my focus is you, not them. And if you're always evangelical about needing to reach everyone, then you're going to average it out and dumb it down. Like you could get fortunate. There are times that someone makes something pure and magical that actually crosses the chasm by itself and reaches a large number of people, right? That if you talk to Liz Gilbert, Eat, Pray, Love, she will tell you was a complete anomaly. It wasn't written to have Julia Roberts in the movie and it wasn't written to sell 10 million copies was written because Liz is a writer. And if you look at the books that Liz has written since then, none of them have tried to be that. They've each tried to be who she is, which is, this is a book for a few people. And if you want it, please read it. Yeah, she has a fan of me. I think her subsequent books are, are just as good, but they didn't sort of capture whatever, who knows what it was. Right, but the magic is she didn't try. And that, you know, if you watch her TED Talk, I talked to her right after she gave it. And The pathos in it is profound. And now her ability to forgive the popular part of her brain that wants it again and say, no, no, that's not going to happen. I'm okay. I'm going to make this instead. That's a life. Seth, are you on permanent book hiatus? Every time I say permanent, I am proven to be incorrect. (laughs) But it's been two years since I wrote What to Do When It's Your Turn, and there is nothing new in the works. If people wanted to shop for and buy more books, I might be inclined to give them my work in that form. But the market is telling us every day what it would rather hear or see. And so I'm trying to listen to them. Very cool. We look forward to future podcasts, Seth. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you guys. Keep making this ruckus. We like to think we're making a little bit of a ruckus around here, Ian. What a fantastic conversation. So much to think about in here. Just a couple of things that jumped out at me. The first one is, you know, towards the end of the conversation, we started talking about the thousand true fans. And, you know, it's so tempting to want to scale your commas and your zeros. Like this is a very like, it's the right thing to do in business, you know? And I love what Seth came to is this idea of, I sort of interpret it as scale your quality or, or scale what you're willing to do for those who get the most out of it. Yep. Certainly something we'd like to model here with the show. The second thing that jumped out to me is another story of an entrepreneur being dissatisfied with transitioning after selling a business that hasn't really been told. And Seth said the reason it hasn't been told is he doesn't think there's a big audience for it. I hope that's not reflected in our book sales coming up here, Ian. Well, it might be. I think, you know, after talking with Seth and after thinking again about the thousand true fan principle, it doesn't really matter if it reaches you know ten thousand people. If it really hits home with a thousand people and it makes sense to them, and it's something actionable that they can use, then that's okay. I believe that, or else I wouldn't have sat down and gone through the misery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd believe that. Finally, Seth, the kind of guy that uh, you want to hang around. I don't think Seth is putting this on to get ahead in life or whatever. This guy is is doing it for the right reasons. What a fantastic contribution he's made to the business world, and, and that's sort of leaked out into to the broader world. So what a thrill for us to have someone that's been an inspiration from day one of this journey to be here on the TMBA podcast. Very cool. So thanks, Seth. If you're interested in the show notes, transcript, you want to make a comment, check out this episode at tropicalmba.com slash Seth 
Godin. And we'll be back, as always, next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you then. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.